And we are uh, we are campus missionaries at UW Madison, and so uh, which Andy kind of explained, and, and we love it. Uh, we've been here about almost two years now. Is that right? Yeah, almost two years. Uh, and we just we last year was us just kind of falling in love with Madison, falling in love with working with college students. Um, it's weird when you're 30 and you're like always the oldest guy in the room. It's, um, <laughs> it's been really helpful to put life in perspective for you. Uh, and so they're like going, like, give us some wisdom. And I'm like, I need wisdom. I'm yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, also just want to say thank you to, to you guys as a church. And, and um, we really do firmly believe that anything that happens through Kyle, but you guys are a part of that. Uh, and so it's not a uh, us, me and Morgan story, but it's really an us story. Because um, you guys, uh, we, we just, we, we couldn't live month to month. We couldn't buy college students meals or, or, or hang out with them if it wasn't for you guys and, and for your generosity and giving towards uh, missions. And so, um, just thank you. Huge thank you. You guys, since day one, have always been a huge friend and supporter. And, like, for real, anytime we get in a pinch, I feel like Pastor Bob is always the first one to, to help bail us out. And so many of you have experienced that yourselves. And I'd say that's a a phenomenal mark of, of pastors and, and pastoral heart. So, love you guys. Um, we, uh, I'm just going to show you just a few photos. Um, so, we've been doing high output uh, these past two years, and um, this year has been incredible. We've had, uh, we've been having about 150 students come out and enjoy that next. <laughs> uh, a photo of the room. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so we meet down on State Street, uh, kind of in this weird, sketchy basement, and soon show up. So hey, it's good. <laughs> it's fun. It works. Uh, it's extremely hot and uncomfortable down there, but it's okay. It's good. Um, and then um, a few weeks ago, we did a baptism service, and so we had yes. eight people total. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we just, we met, and then we walked down to Mendota, threw a few people up in the lake. It was a little chilly. Uh, but overall, it was a good time. It was a good time. And so um, I'm sure you guys will be coming out to hang out with us on a Monday night again. Yeah. And you can ask your friends. It was the, it's the best thing you can do in Madison on a Monday night. So next time you should come out, too. We'll bring everybody. Uh, but this morning, I want to talk about this idea of better together. Better together. Turn to your neighbor and say, we are better together. I hope, hope you knew your neighbor or else that you just had an awkward moment in church and that's all right. Um, but there are some things in life, right, that just fit really, really well together, um, right? So if you're like, man, it's the end of the day. I want to eat some cookies. I want to sit down and eat some cookies and I need a tall glass of Milk. Milk. Yeah, yeah. Like, you don't want water. Mm -mm. You don't want, you know, you want milk. It just, it's like, it just rolls off the tongue. It's like fitting. Um, the, like a burger and fries. Uh, November and rain. No, not so much. You know what they say, November showers bring December flowers. Um, I think. Wisconsin and cheese, right? Um, Aaron Rodgers and... Yeah, yeah. Rest in peace, Aaron Rodgers. I'm praying for you. Uh, <laughs> Brett Favre and we don't know. We don't know. Where, where does Brett Favre belong? Is he a Packer? Is he a Viking? Is he a Jet? Does anybody remember the one he had? That was weird. Uh, it was like everything was wrong in the universe. Everything was broken. Um, I would say Capital City Church and Chi Alpha. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 All right. yeah. 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 Um, and 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 really, um, I would say. Uh, the, the Bible, the gospel, and relationship are one of those parents. Um, that, that all of Christianity is, is built on this one idea of relationship. You see it since the, the, from the very first chapter of the Bible, and then it's woven throughout the rest of the book. And it's this idea that God desires relationship with people. Uh, then he, he, so he creates man, and even man, he's in, he's in the Garden of Eden, he's in paradise. And even then, it's like, man, it's not good for man to be alone. This is even, there's no sin in the world, but you realize, it, it, hey, like, people need each other. The relationship need, it is, is a fundamental truth to all of Christianity. And so, 
um, man, who you do life with and, and, and who you keep in proximity to you will, will matter a, a lot in how you live, who you become, what you value. Um, one of my, my kind of litmus tests for this of like, who, who are my people? Who are people that would really like care about me is uh, I don't go like extreme like who would bail you out of jail because like people you know anybody would take extreme measure the better a better question is who this afternoon if you had to move everything in your house would show up and help you move yeah. that's like that's who those are the people who really love you uh, this is what I've found because moving is the worst uh, it's not life threatening so people aren't going to be like oh I'll be the hero and swoop in bail you out of jail it's not that extreme uh, but it's also sacrificial and extremely annoying. And so it's like, uh, but people who will show up to help you move, that is probably the best picture of who your real true community is. And so if you're ever wondering, who are my real friends in life? Just write on Facebook and you might get a lot of likes. Uh, but I don't know that all those likes will show up to your house and say, I'm moving this afternoon. Who, could, I, I'm in a pitch, who's going to show up? And whoever shows up, those are your real friends. Everybody else, get rid of them. No, that's not what this is about. Um, but better together. Who are the people that, that, that you do life with? And, and man, I just am a firm believer that as Christians, like we should be experts. We should be the best at relationships. We should, we should love people better. We should care about people better. We should uh, display better friend to friend relationships, we should display healthier marriages and, and homes and, and healthier parenting ways. Why? Because, um, believe it or not, uh, if you maybe this is your first time in church and you don't know this, but if you've been hanging around in church, what we tell the world is, hey, guess what? You need a relationship with Jesus, and so this relationship will change your life, and, and, and He wants to come, and He wants to give you hope and joy and love and grace and mercy. <laughs> And then you look around sometimes in churches and you look, everybody looks kind of sad, like somebody kicked your puppy. And it's like, man, there's this, there's this disconnect between the words we're using, how we're describing the community that we want to be and how we want to live, and how it's actually coming to life in the world around us. And so we're going to really lock in and, and talk about this idea of being better together. So relationships have a massive uh, impact, impact and, and imprint on your life. There's a few ways, maybe unique ways, um, that relationships affect you. Do you know that uh, relationships is actually one of the primary ways that you learn? Um, and, and at different stages of life, this impacts you more or less. And so, for example, my kids, who are all four and under, they, their primary spot where they're learning how to speak and act and communicate is, is from mom and dad, right? And so, uh, anytime that they do something that, that uh, I always jokingly say whenever uh, our kids are acting up, I always say, that's learned behavior, honey. And that's from you. Uh, <laughs> and that's probably not true. Uh, that's just learned behavior. Um, but, but a lot of that is. Uh, so, case in point, example, how many of you say, I want to go get a pop. I'm going to drink a pop this afternoon. No one. All right. How many of you are like, I'm going to drink a soda? A few of you, okay. Any soda pop people? Soda pop? Get my soda pop. Um, yeah, so like, again, that's that's a lot of based upon like where you grew up. How about, I'm going to go get a drink from the bubbler. The bubbler. Uh, how about the water fountain? I'm going to get a drink from the water fountain. A few of you, okay. Yep. How many uh, Packer fans in this room? A few of you. How many non-Packer fans in the room? Yeah, okay. Wow. <laughs> A lot of times we associate, man, I learned a lot from my parents, but if you grew up with a lot of siblings, you actually learn more, and, and you're, you're actually affected more relationally by the dynamic of sibling to sibling than you are parent to parent, uh, because it's this idea of the people that are on your same level uh, really affect who you and, and how you live and become. Next is um, who you keep in close proximity to you actually affects your health. Uh, the people around you could literally be killing you. Uh, don't, don't look at your spouse if they're in the room. Don't look at them. It's not worth it. No. <laughs> your wife is like, I know. They're killing My husband is killing me. Um, but there is a 25% chance 
that, that if you have close, meaningful relationships that you will live, you can live five to ten years longer because of, of the health, what it does for your heart and your soul. Um, and, and likewise, um, when you're around stressful people, or if you, you feel like you actually don't have anybody, you have increased chances of, of cholesterol, uh, heart problems, heart issues, and so, like I said, the people around you may be killing you. You're like, I need new people. Um, but I, man, and, and I would say it, it doesn't, you know, if you've been around church at all too, you know, like, who, who you walk in Christianity with is going to define a lot of how you live. Or who you don't walk in Christianity with will, will determine a lot of how you live. And so we're going to talk about this idea of being better together. Um, and I, I really believe that. I believe that as Kyle, but we're better off because we're partnered with a church like you who cares about, also cares about this local community. And, um, and I hope you guys feel that about us. Like, hey, Capital City, we're better off because we know the questions because of Chi Alpha. And, um, but let's also be, let's be better. We are better together, but let's also be better together. Does that make sense? Like, let, let's strive to be better. You know, let's strive to do together better. Let's, let's strive to do relationships better. And so I want to read a story in the Bible. It's in Luke 5, if you have your Bibles. And it's one of the best stories on relationships, I think, in the New Testament. And to be honest, we don't really ever get to know the, the, the characters' names or, or their occupations. We don't really learn too many important facts about them, but they display one of the best small groups, missional communities, one of the best relationship, Christian relationships that you see, I think, in all of the Bible. And it says this in Luke 5, starting in verse 17. If you don't have your Bible... We'll have the words up there, and also, I'm pretty sure we can probably get you a Bible before you leave. Um, verse 17 says this, One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles in the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, I love that, when Jesus saw their faith, their collective faith, when he saw the faith of all the men who carried this man there, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Let's talk, uh, let's pray maybe one last time. God, would you open up our hearts and, and, and really just open up our lives and say, God, how can we uh, know you better and love you better? But also, how can we do life with other people better? How can we live better uh, with the people around us? In your name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I love, I love, I love this story. I, I think like, man, this is, this is a picture of what church should be. This is what it should look like when you're around Christians. And, and, and I love it because it's, we don't know their story. I love it because we, we don't know all the details of their life. But, but in this one, through this one act, we see like very, what, what would be appropriate for how we should look. Uh, if, even if people never knew our names, and even if we never got credit, and even if we never got glory for any of our actions, how should we live? How should we naturally try to function? And I love that the primary way and the primary focus that all these guys have collectively is this idea that together, if we could get this guy in front of Jesus, it would change his life. And so we will do, collectively, we will do whatever we have to do to get this guy before Jesus. Because if he could see Jesus, it would change his whole life. I wonder when's the last time you sat with a group of people and you kind of looked around and said, man, if we could just get this person or Jesus, I think it would actually change their life. And so, uh, kind of my first question or challenge for us this morning is this idea of whose map will you carry? Whose map will you carry? Um, I don't know a lot uh, of things, but I know that the story takes place in the Middle East, and the Middle East is usually pretty hot. Uh, and so here's, uh, I don't know, anybody ever try to carry a grown man? Super inconvenient. It's the worst. Uh, like, I have to carry a four-year-old, and I don't like that all the time. Uh, that's kind of inconvenient. But here's a grown man, and, 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 and they, they come together, and a group of guys, and they say, man, like, let's, well, I guess he needs Jesus. He can't walk. He's not going to get to Jesus any other way. So 
I guess we're, it's our job, we'll pick them up and we'll carry them. We don't know how far they go, but I would imagine that it's highly inconvenient, it's highly uncomfortable, and, and, and it's just not conducive, it, it's like, it, it stinks, it's not a great day. It's not fun when you have to carry, like again, this idea of when you move, moving's the worst. Why? Because you have to carry heavy things that are awkwardly shaped and, and inconvenient. I wonder who, whose life would you be inconvenienced for? Whose life are you inconvenienced for? Can you, can you think, like, in, in my workplace, who, who, who do I allow myself to be inconvenienced for? Right? It's easy maybe when it's at home and it's, it's yeah, a younger kid or, or maybe hopefully even with a spouse sometimes, right? Like marriage is great and super convenient, but also marriage sometimes is highly inconvenient. <laughs> but let's go beyond that. How, how about your neighbors? When's the last time that you were inconvenienced by the need of a, a neighbor? Better question, when's the last time you knew of the need of your neighbor? When's the last time that, 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 you, that in your workplace you walked in and you said, God, you know what? Let my life be inconvenienced today by one of my coworkers. <laughs> never. We never pray that prayer. Why? Be, be, because it's not natural. It, it doesn't feel right. But so so. But what changes the thing is, is that they see a need that, that only Jesus can meet. And I wonder if we stop seeing needs that only Jesus can meet. We look around us in our workspaces. We look around us in our neighborhoods, and we just assume like. Uh, it's okay. Like I, they're probably. I, I'll just assume everyone's fine because that's easier. But this, uh, this is this story is great because the story is all about sacrifice and inconvenience and saying, hey, hey, these guys at some point looked around and said, we're responsible for what's happening here. We're responsible for this life, and I'm going to take on that responsibility. Maybe Andy, would you help me with? with you guys are. We're going to get a little uncomfortable. It'll be good. Those will be scratching. Well, let's say, and come here real quick. Right, I'm just going to have you hop up here. Okay. Right. So this is awkward. This is inconvenient. Um, but this is what had is happening in the story, right? It was like a bunch of grown men carrying another grown man around. And it's, it is awkward. It's not comfortable. This is not how you're supposed to preach. Like, this is, this is dumb. But, here, I'll push you down. That was good. Thank you. Good. Go team. Um, but, but. Actually on fire, and he couldn't get out. I mean, I would hope that I would. I would say, man, I'll I'll pick you up and I'll drag you out of here right now. And I wonder uh, what happened in our lives where, where we we experienced this amazing grace in our life. We said, God, I'm so blown away that you would love me, that you would save me, that you would transform me. We're going to walk out the doors and say, and good luck, everybody else. Right. And so I love it because these guys, this is a picture of what joining a, a, a small group should look like. This is a picture, man, this is what we, to be honest, this is what we try to tell college students. In a day and age where, where more and more students grow up and they feel detached from this idea of home and family than ever before in the history of the world, we say, hey, come and, come and be a part of our family. And we will, we will gladly be as inconvenienced by your life as you will allow us. And, and it is, man, I'll tell you, it is highly inconvenient on a Saturday night when you get a call at 2 a.m. from a drunk college student saying, hey, I don't know where I am, but could you come pick me up? Uh -huh. And that's the moment where you have to decide, does this, does this, does this actually matter or doesn't it? Yeah. it, it it's inconvenient to, to three or four nights a week have college students come over and say, can you, wash my, can you help me wash my laundry? Can, you know, can we come eat your food? It, like... But, but man, I'm not talking about letting people take advantage of you. I'm talking about like meaningful relationship where you say, God, I want, to, I want to have eyes that see problems. I want to carry somebody else's map. And so, right, I can carry Andy all by myself. But you know what gets more fun and gets a little easier is when you do it together. When you do it in community, when, when a few of you say, hey, let's come around this person because we can carry somebody further. We can carry them more effectively. We can get them to Jesus even quicker. And this is the picture of what the church should be, is that you come together and you say, man, here's, I have this coworker and they're going through this. And they could use some prayer, yes. But they could also use some meals. They could use some car rides. And we're going to come around them together and we're just going to say, hey, how can we love you well? And what's, man, what's amazing, I'll tell you, like, this, this last year, we, we, we came to Madison and we're like, man, we're going to like sacrifice for college students. And, and we were like so proud of ourselves through, through January. And then, man, what we started to hear and see was stories of college students doing even more and going even further than we, we ever did or could. 
And when you get around 18, 19 year olds who are saying, I will let my life be inconvenienced to reach other classmates, other friends around campus, it, it like, it moves you, it, it changes your life. I would just challenge you, man, Christianity is extremely boring unless you start to get dirty, unless you start to pick up people who are in the dirt, unless you start to really experience real deep, meaningful relationship, you're just going to grow tired of Christianity real quick. So we are better together. Whose map are you going to carry? Who are you going to be inconvenienced by? How are you going to live differently because of the needs you see in the world around you? And I would say, again, man, that's why we, we, we really are. Some of you give sacrificially so that we can do what God's called us to do, and that matters. That's why when I say, man, you were reaching UW-Madison, you guys are, are, are reaching 150 students. It's not, it's not us, it's you. It's all of us collectively carrying our own little corner of this map of saying that UW campus and saying we're going to do whatever we can, however big or however small, to get people to Jesus. So whose map will we carry? The sec second point or second challenge is this idea is that um, not only whose map will we carry, but you have to have a can't stop, won't stop mentality. You have to, you have to, uh, and again, a lot of it's going to be on, on, based on your perspective and how great the need you see. And so uh, these guys, right, they come around, they're like, yeah, we'll be inconvenienced. Like, we care about this guy, let's get him to Jesus. So they pick him up, they're lugging him around the Middle East, they're lugging him around Israel, they get him to this house, and uh, side note, they get there, and, and this could be a whole other message, but there's a whole bunch of church people blocking the way to Jesus. Yeah. And we won't talk about that this morning. But, but sometimes that's how it is. Sometimes people are trying to get to Jesus, but there's a whole bunch of church people just watching Jesus and not trying to let Jesus live deep inside their heart, where they're looking out and saying, who else can we go reach? And they're actually blocking the way to get to Jesus. And so they get this guy there, and they could have just said, well, you know what? We did our part. We got him close enough. Hopefully Jesus sees them on the exit out. Because we're not getting through this crowd. But I love it because, it, and this is why it's fun to do it in community. Because anytime you get a group of people together, you get better ideas. Or maybe not better ideas, but just different ideas. You have that friend who always comes up with different ideas. Um, I, was, I was that person. I was always offering up the different idea. There's a place for us who think differently. It's all right. Right? You get there, and it's like, man, Jesus is so close. But, but we still, he's still not in front of Jesus. And, and then the, that different thinker is like, well, we could throw him on the roof. No! <laughs> you don't throw a guy who can't walk out of high, like, up higher. That's not conducive. I don't, again, I'm not a physician. I don't know all the ins and outs, but that's not good. This is illogical thinking. But man, when, when you've carried somebody's burden for a little bit, you start to get creative and, 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 and what you can do to get them before Jesus. Because, man, once you started to shoulder that weight a little bit, you're like, man, I didn't bring you all this far so we could just get you kind of close to Jesus. I got you all, I, I, I've carried you this far so you could see Jesus face Amen. to face. Because when you see him clearly face to face, that's when your life is transformed. And I think sometimes we get people to the edge of the church and we're like, well, I smiled at them. Well, that's great, but that smile won't change their eternity. And, and they actually need a moment, a face-to-face -face encounter with Christ to transform their life. So they get there, the one creative friend says, yeah, let's throw them on the roof. And that friend is usually more persuasive than the, the sound thinkers, and they're like, well, well I might as well, all right? So, they're, so now they're lugging a guy up on a roof on a house. Jesus is trying to have a nice little, like, moment teaching. Um, I don't know that he is, but definitely everybody in the room is like watching and trying to see what's happening. And I love it because they just start digging. They start vandalizing the home. They do. They, they, are, they, are, they, are, they would be arrested. Like, if somebody comes to your house and they start ripping up shingles off your roof, call the cops. This is not, um, this is not good. Why? Why would you go that far? Because you actually would believe that that, that if he could see Jesus, he would walk. Because you actually believe it, like deep in your heart, deep in your soul, you realize this is the only solution. And, and, and anything short of them encountering the, the real Jesus Christ is worthless. So I will rip through anybody's roof. I, I, I'll fight through any crowd. If I can just have somebody see Jesus just for a moment. Yes. Man, this is all. This is great. Like this would be. I would attend this church if these guys started a church. I would be there. 
And I don't even know if they can sing, if they can preach. I don't know if they have good organizational charts. But I know this. I know they wouldn't stop and they wouldn't quit on me when everybody else would. And they wouldn't walk by me and they wouldn't feel irresponsible for me. They would pick me up. We need, we need Christians. We need people who love Jesus. Amen. And because they so love Jesus, they're so in love with who he is, they're so grateful for what he's done that they fall in love with other people. And they just say, man, no matter, you, you, there's nothing you could do. There, there's nowhere you could run where I would stop caring about you, stop praying for you, stop intentionally trying to bump into you. Having a can't stop, won't stop mentality. Man, what a, what a crazy world that, that it's no longer the first place that, man, I'm going through something hard. And our first response is saying, I don't know much, but I hear those Christians are pretty good at helping people out. Man, that would be an awesome story right in this neighborhood. I don't know much, but I know I have a friend of a friend who stopped by Capital City Church one time. And man, I don't, I don't know everything that happened there. But man, they really cared. They really cared for my friend. Man, God has called you to do something so great that you can't do it on your own. This is, the, again, because, it, 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 again, so now some of us are picturing, like, yeah, i got to go find somebody. And you're picturing yourself doing this alone. But dream bigger than that. Dream, dream a dream where it's like, no, we, we need different people who have different skill sets. We need the crazy thinker who wants to throw somebody on the roof, but we also need a strong guy who can carry somebody up on the roof. We, you know, we need somebody, like, we need somebody who's, gonna, who's great with words. We need somebody who can cook. We, we need a whole community to come around people. God's called this church to do something so great they can't do it alone. We need everybody. Amen. My last uh, kind of point is, is this idea of let's be a problem for other people's problems. Let's be a problem for the world's problems. And Morgan, do you want me to pop up? But let's be the type of people who, who, who look at messed up things in the world and we say, you know what? Let's be a problem for them. Um, that was really, uh, like, some of my friends, they joke, the best way to get Levi to do something is tell him he can't do it or he shouldn't do it. Uh, it still works, even though I'm like, should be responsible and I have kids and I'm married. Still, the most surefire way to get me to do something is like, oh, you can't do that. Uh, and that's actually how I got to Madison. Uh, to be honest, like, uh, man, I, I was meeting with a friend of mine and he said, man, we, like, that campus needs Jesus, badly. Yes. And, and I was a, a youth pastor, so I had sent high school students down to Madison, and it did not go well. Um, and and it's just, man, like, we need some, we need God to move in Madison. Like, we, we need somebody has to do something at that campus. And I was like, say, say I won't. No, I'm just, and you know, like, um, and it's just this idea, of like, man, there's, like, we should be the people who, who are looking at the world's biggest problems and saying, oh, well, we've got the perfect solution. We've got something that's so contrary to that. We've got, we've got a, a lifestyle that's totally different. We've got a way of thinking that's totally different. That should, that, 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 it, it's time that we just stop playing defense all the time. We're like, yeah, I don't know. You, yeah, you need Jesus, and you need Jesus. I don't know how we're going to get you there. And we start going on the offensive, and we say, hey, we, we can't, maybe we can't get everybody today, but we can get you. And we're going to carry you for a little bit. And you know what? Here's the other, the other truth of this. is Sometimes you're going to come to church for a while. And, and you're going to be carrying mats. And then you're going, to, you're going to have a season where you're like, you know what? Man, I need people. I need someone to carry me. I need, I need people to come around me. And then you're going to hop on. And we'll carry you for a little bit. And then, and then you're going to walk by somebody else. Or somebody else can say, hey, I need a turn. Now, we can't have you stay on that mat forever, so, so we want you to, to get better and get healthy. And, and man, if, if you're really seeing Jesus for who he is, he, man, he can do the miraculous. He can change your life. But let's say, like, like uh, man, hypothetically, um, I don't know, let's say hypothetically there, there was a guy, and he was a, a campus pastor at UW-Madison, and hypothetically, right, he had, like, real, like, anger problems sometimes, hypothetically. Right? And although he's a pastor and although he, he leads a ministry, like, man, sometimes like, he just wants to, like, just flip out. That would be a problem, right? That would not be good. Let's say hypothetically, right, there is a, this 
same thing. Maybe the same guy, hypothetically. And, and he had like financial issues. It was like, man, I, I have this thing that I think God's called me to do. But I literally can't do it unless somebody helps finance some of this. And then hypothetically, what if a church said, yeah, we'll, we'll help support you. We'll help you apart. We'll help you be a problem for the world's problems. And, and what if, like, like, like if this is our problem, what if it was instead of me just like trying to carry this problem all, all around, and all of us together, we stood up and we're like, no, like, let's come around this thing together. Man, that's, that's awesome. It could change the world, right? This is it's a revolutionary idea. But if you got people before Jesus, it could change the world. And, and here's, here's the after effect of what happens with this story. These guys carry this guy. They get to the house. They don't know how to get him in, so they, they throw him on the roof. They dig through the roof. They throw him, and then they finally get him before Jesus. And it actually flips the whole town upside down. This is what, read the rest of it when you get home, homework. Uh, the, what happens is, like, Jesus says, hey, your sins are forgiven. And it leads to this conversation where Jesus gets to proclaim who he is. And he says, I'm not just a nice guy. I don't just speak kind words. I'm actually the savior of the world. And so I am the only one who can forgive sins. And so although I'm saying you can get up and walk, it, 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 I also can say your sins are forgiven. It's not because you're, you're a sinner. It, it's, just, it's not about who you are. It's actually about who I am. And I'm the only one that can transform your whole world. And the rest of this town is just blown away by this. This is what's so fun about doing college ministry. Man, when you have a kid who used to be known on front row, and then they end up at an altar on a Monday night, and everybody's like, what happened to him? Why? He, he really took a left turn there. Because he, he, he was going this way, but now he's going this. What happened? And then you say, man, I, the only thing, the only plausible solution is that Jesus got a hold of his life, and it changed everything. And instead of searching for, for wholeness through broken systems, I've now found the healer who can actually heal and restore my life. Man, when, when you see kids who, who are so smart, uh, they actually stop believing in God because they're so smart and they can linear think things, but they, it doesn't change the God shaped hole in their heart. And then they sit in a small group because a friend of a friend said, I don't know, but I, uh, although they're, they're highly intelligent, there seems to be something missing. Man, you should, you should come experience this weird group called Chi Alpha. <laughs> and then it just throws linear thinking out the, out, out the window. I mean, it's still there, and all the knowledge is there, but it's like, yeah. But now I see how this works in conjunction with who God is. This is what the world needs. The world needs people who are saying, I'm going to be a problem for the world's problems. I love, um, in James 5, I'm going to end with this, it, it, James just paints this beautiful picture of how community should work, how we should do life together. It says, above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear by heaven or earth or by anything else. All you need is to say a simple yes or no, otherwise you'll, uh, you'll be condemned. And then it goes into this idea of community in verse 13. And is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church and pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Saying, what are you going through in life? Are you, are you hurt? Are you broken? You need each other. Yeah, you need Jesus. But a, a primary way that's going to come to life is through other people. It, it's awesome. It's beautiful, right? And, and yes, you need that internal moment where, where, where God, like that internal thing where in your brain or in your heart or your soul, you're like, yes, I need Jesus. I can feel him in a moment. But then you also need other people who, who embody that with skin and bones. And say, man, you don't have to carry that shame anymore. You don't, you don't have to carry that hurt. Man, I don't view you any different. It's not my job to condemn or, 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 or put you down. It's just my job to get you before Jesus, because Jesus will do the rest of the work. Amen. So let's do this. If you would, would you just close your eyes just for a few seconds as we process this? Try to live differently because of this. If you're in this place this morning, and um, man, you're just like, 
you kind of feel like the, the guy in the store who's just crippled on the side of the road and you're not really sure why you are here this morning or how you got here. Um, but you just you just want to be prayed for this morning. You just say, man, I'm, I'm in need. I need help. If that's you this morning, if every eye closed, you just raise your hand. We just want to pray for you. That's it. Awesome. God, we just pray for these hands, God. Lord, we pray, um, God, that you would do what only you can do, and that, 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 that you would you would just very much be in this place and in these lives and these situations. God, we don't know whether there's pain from broken relationships or or from poor decision making or or maybe just weird random situations. God, but but we're so glad that, that when we see you and we get before you. God, you can change us. And God, I pray, even more importantly, God, that, that for each of these hands, that they would lean into community. They would look around and say, I, I can't do this on my own. I, I need other people. I need some help. Likewise, with every eye closed, if you're in this room and, and you're just saying, you know what, I need to, I need to carry some mats. I need to be, I need to allow myself to be inconvenienced by some other people in my world. If that's you this morning, would you just raise your hand so that we can pray for you? Yeah, God, we just pray for these hands. God, we pray, God, that we wouldn't just talk hypothetically about who you are, how you function, what your characteristics are. God, that we would embody them. God, that, that we would proactively look for the problems of our world. We would look for people who are who are lonely who are maybe going through seasons of depression. God, we would look for, for, for couples that are maybe on the brink of divorce. We, we would look for parents, single moms who are struggling with kids. We would look for, uh, it doesn't matter how wealthy or not wealthy the people are around us, God, we would look for people who have needs in their heart and in their soul. And God, we would, we would just pray and ask how we could love them well, and then we would do it. God, that, that, that this Sunday morning would lead us to more uh, times grabbing coffee with people and just saying, just let's just talk about how life's going. To, to more meals around dinner tables and lunch tables. To more times even watching Packer games together. God, whatever it is. God, but the, we would lean in, into embodying all these awesome, beautiful, amazing words that we talk about in church. That by people being around us, that they would feel love, they would feel grace, they would feel mercy. They would feel joy. They would, they would feel just a, a sense of uh, being able to live out who you genuinely are. So God, we, we love you. We're crazy about you. God, we're so grateful that that, that you, God, that, that we are all in that spot. God, I'm still in that spot sometimes. That where I just need a Savior who's kind and patient with me and who can heal me. In your name we pray.